My name is Dave Simison. I'm an attorney uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, which is outside Washington, D.C. That's where the Naval Academy is. Great. And um, you can tell us what got you to Standing Rock? Um, a high school friend and I have been going back and forth, kind of challenging each other. Are we going to go out there? When are we going to go out there? And he got out there um, late August. And um, I guess it was, uh, you know, I, I saw, as so many people did, I saw the, the uh, attack dogs online, and that upset me so much that um, I felt like I had to go out and take a stand. And uh, on the Friday before Labor Day, you know, a year ago, uh, he said, when are you coming out? And I said, here I come. And so I left Maryland the Tuesday after Labor Day and uh, met up with him. As an attorney, he had given me, he had made some contacts because he's a photographer. He has thousands of pictures. He's going to bring uh, a dozen by of all of his photos for your use, as I understand it. But, um, and so I reached out to the uh, legal collective there, but they, you know, they didn't know me, so uh, they were concerned, uh, you know, in vetting and stuff. And I tried to meet their, uh, what their concerns were, but it never worked out. So I became known as, uh, because I said, look, I just want to help. They said, well, what, you could do dishes. So I became known as the lawyer who did dishes. Great. And um, do you have any past experience um, with activism? Um, just going back, you know, t to the Vietnam era, I was very active then, uh, but not really since. Um, so I was uh, at Colorado State University a long time, probably before you guys were born or something, but um, I was there, and uh, when Wounded Knee was going on and, and the American Indian Movement was just starting, uh, Russell Means came to the campus and spoke. You know, I've I've always been interested in those concerns. Kind of like what were your expectations coming in, and then what was your reality when you were here? Well, um, you know, as an attorney, my I think my expectation was to be able to use my legal skills more than I than I got to do. Um, and I went out twice. I went out uh, right around Labor Day, and was there for about it was a three day drive out, and then. Um, uh, I stayed about eight or nine days, and then there was a three-day back. So I was gone a while. I was just amazed at, um, I don't know, I hate to use a, a term like vibe, but just the feeling you had there. The camp was so warm and giving, and everybody was so open and friendly, and everybody was pitching in and working in the same direction. Um, Back then, we had a the camp camp people from the camp went up to uh, Bismarck for a, a, an action up there on the uh, state grounds, and uh, that was great. And then we had uh, I guess it was it was where the pipeline crossed 1806, uh, which became the location of what the forward camp. Um, we had a couple prayer marches up to that location. My first, in my first visit. So my second visit um, was in October, and um, and I arrived um, around five o'clock in the afternoon, and it was the day that the forward camp had been overrun, and um, I had spent most of my time around the Hoopa kitchen, uh, Grandma's Hoopa kitchen. And um, so that's where I went. I went went there, and um, there were uh, some some of the riders. Uh, they were there. Uh, you know that was just so traumatic for so many people, and the, the kitchen was overrun. And so the Hoopa Kitchen had all their gear up there, and they had no no supplies or anything. So that's that was my calling. I went up to Bismarck and bought. And the stoves, pots and pans, and everything to keep get that 
kitchen going again. Mm -hmm. And then the, there was a question whether the police were going to give anything back. So people were pretty upset. Uh, you know, I mean, people were pretty traumatized from that event, obviously. And then I guess it was a couple days later, there was the uh, event where people were trying to cross the river and they were standing in the water and the police were uh, aligned against them in battle gear. And, uh, you know, I, I remember checking my phone's temperature that morning when I woke up and it was 33 degrees, so the water was as cold as water gets without freezing. And, the, and that's where the water protectors were standing in the water and the police weren't letting them come out of it and the and the water protectors were doing nothing and um, and <laughs> the brutality The, br the brutality I witnessed was something I'd never seen. And to see police who were fully decked out, they had nothing to fear from anything. And they're going to point blank range. And I saw this. I, I witnessed this. And they would shoot people at point blank range. And they were macing people in their face at point blank range. And I'm an attorney, and, I, and there was like, I've never seen anything like this, and there was nothing I could do. Nothing I could do. I just felt so helpless. I didn't, you know, you can't get violent because it's, that's a whole losing proposition. They are so well armed, and they were so ready for violence. There was just nothing to do. And, and, uh, I had to leave just, I had to leave that location. I went back to the camp, and, uh, and I think that day everybody, just that whole week had just been so difficult. Uh, it had been so violent. Um, not from our side, but from the other side. And I think, uh, as, you, as you can see, I'm still affected by it. <laughs> it's a year later, right? And I can't imagine the people who were in the water being maced, being shot, they, they're still carrying that. And when I went back to the camp, people in camp were still carrying it. To be, to be attacked like that for no reason was just, in my experience, I've never experienced anything like that. It was astonishing. And, um, and I, I don't think, I couldn't really hold it emotionally, so I ended up leaving camp camp later that day. I, I just couldn't handle it, so I had to leave. And uh, so I've been back in, in uh, Maryland. I am an attorney. I went down to the federal court when there was the hearing um, I, in June, I guess. There was a hearing in federal court about whether or not, because um, we know that, that Trump fast-tracked approval and so there was a hearing on whether that fast track was a, was appropriate so I went to that hearing and uh, the court later ruled that the fast track was inappropriate and the Army Corps of Engineers has to go back and uh, and so now you know so I've been tracking that um, through the Native American Rights Fund They're, they have offices in DC largely in Boulder but um, so I've been trying to stay involved and keep people informed about the legal process going on in D.C. That's my story. That's my story from Standing Rock. Oh, and the minor story is, um, I don't know if you've seen, because I, I, I brought up about 400 bumper stickers. They're white and they say, I stand with Standing Rock. And uh, so I brought those out. I designed them and brought them out. And, uh, and I have a banner on my car that looks just like I'm down there. So that's my story. Um, I, I want to ask you just like, because I know that you came and then you came back. Um, but like, how were those transitional periods for you? 
if you'd like to share. Like, how was kind of going like, back home at the second the f- time? The funny thing was, um, I had to get back home. Um, fam, there were family medical issues that I had to get back home for. I wanted to turn. Around. I, I didn't from the first time. I didn't want to leave, but uh, the second time, camps. The vibe in camp had changed because camp had been attacked so viciously. So, you know, everybody was, I think, a little on edge. So the camp was edgier uh, the second time around. Uh, and I, I wish I'd gotten out there earlier, so then I would have been able to transition with it, you know, as opposed to the one experience and then the second. Does that answer that question? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how did you kind of not you and everyone else here, what did you see that people were doing to kind of like take care of themselves and like, while this was happening to kind of keep that survival spirit? Well, I mean, the camp experience was just so phenomenal because everybody, if you needed anything, you, you, you had whatever you needed. And if you didn't have it, people got it to you. And um, I brought a lot of stuff out with me. And uh, I got donations in Maryland from people. So I had a full truck of stuff that I brought out, uh, the people that donated. And, um, you know, I, I, I was taking pictures of, uh, I was very reluctant to take any pictures um, because I just didn't think it was my place. But um, I did get a picture of a guy, you know, chopping wood. And, I, um, and you know, the people were bringing, you know, as you know, uh, truckloads of wood in because uh, it was getting cold and um, one of my friends that I met out there the first trip uh, I helped fund her and she and uh, Sonny who's with uh, uh, Crow in Montana they went up and got brought down hundreds of TP poles uh, on a flatbed that she got in Colorado that probably is an answer to question here. I mean, I think that like it does answer in the sense that everybody was kind of there for each other. So you to- everybody care. was totally. Oh, it was it was unbelievable. I've never been in a community of people like that, where everybody was helping everybody. And uh, when I went back to Maryland after my first trip, uh, I did a report from Standing Rock because the newspaper, the local newspaper, mentioned that this lawyer from Annapolis had gone out to Standing Rock. So I made this report and put it in my window as a poster. It was in a couple other shop windows in Annapolis. And that was, you know, the place was so giving and the place was so clean and everything was so... I I, (laughs) I don't know. Uh, I've been to a lot of festivals and stuff and um, the porta pots at festivals are, you know, marginal, and the Sandy Rock is kind of like, at least when I was out there, it was amazing how people were just picking up trash everywhere, chasing flies off their nose. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was really amazing. And, you know, I ate at the Hoopa Kitchen, and helped out there, helped make meals there, and Everybody's pitching out. How do you think, um, kind of like, I know you've been following the legal end of things. Moving forward, I guess, like, what are some of your predictions of what's going to happen, or like, what are some of your hopes, or, or kind of like. I think originally I thought, you know, it's kind of hopeless. There's no way to stop this multi billion dollar pipeline that's, that they basically built except for going under the river. Um, but now I have more hope because uh, this judge has slowed the Army Corps down and said there are certain things you didn't consider that you have to consider. And they may, they may decide that, uh, that they can't continue where it is. Now they may cross somewhere else. Um, so there's that quote, fallback position by the pipeline company. But I, I think that things look pretty good. Pretty good. I don't know. I don't know what to think of the judge. I've read, I, you know, I did read a little bit about him just to see where he'd be coming from. 
and uh, he's he's going to rule, I think, any day now, whether or not the pipeline can be used while the study is being done. And I have, I have, uh, I met, met made some friends out there, and they told me that, like even a month ago, the pipeline was not active, and they had a, a really hard time drilling under uh, the river because they hit bedrock, and the drill bits kept breaking. And they hang out in the casino, and they hear that from the workers and stuff. So I don't even know if the pipeline is in use at this stage, but um, hopefully it doesn't go into use. Period. And of course, Standing Rock is has come to stand more than for Standing Rock. It's more than it's more than no dapple. Now. You know, it's it's across the across the country and around the world now. It means something. People are getting uh, because of it. People are now conscious about the importance of you know clean water. We shouldn't have to buy water. <laughs> If you could um, share a piece of advice with others, what would it be? <laughs> share a piece of it. And what would I be advising them about? Anything? <laughs> anything? Anything you would want the world to know? If we forgot to ask anything, right? I, really I, I just, for my own self, I just want to be more humble and uh, listen more, talk less. At least I'm going to share my experience here, uh, but listen more and stay within myself, kind of. Uh, oh, I know, I know. Uh, I think it's live simply so that others may simply live. So that's my advice: live simply so others may simply live.